Father, it's a joy to sing a song that's been sung by the church for hundreds of years. Lord, it makes me stop and think that while we meet here today, we are connected to a much larger body, your body, your children, the people that you have chosen to save from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and time. Lord, we, we worship you today the same as thousands, millions of people have worshiped you before us. Lord, the gospel that we place our faith in is the same that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the 12 apostles, that the church has placed its faith in from the beginning. It is the only good news. Father, as we get to look at your word this morning, as we... Um, have it um, shape our lives as it speaks to us, as it informs us. Give, us. give us grace. Give me wisdom. Do ask that the Spirit would speak in and through me this morning and the Spirit would lead us all. Father, be with us as we get to just center our minds on your word and your name. Amen. Well, I, I would invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 22 as we continue making our way through the Book of the Covenant. Um, I just want to state once again just the timely manner of us going through this section of Scripture. Um, several weeks ago, we got to look at racism and the judgmentalism seen in slavery. That's from chapter 21. That clearly is very timely for the state of our nation. Last week, we got to look at the image of God and how and that everyone inherently possesses the image of God and that it changes how we interact with those around us, again, with this judgmentalism that is so rampant in our society today. And this week, in sticking with the theme of being very timely, we're going to look at social justice. Now, the reason we're looking at social justice is because Scripture speaks on that in Exodus 22, 16 through 23, 9. Even the title of social justice can uh, well up in us many emotions. Even when I said it this morning, you may have wondered, what? He's speaking on what? What's going to happen? Honestly, social justice and the social justice movement is, has been um, on the forefront of, of our current political and national um, scene. It it's really has permeated our, the climate, and that's both inside and outside the people of God. Inside the people of God, it has run rampant in the churches. The distinctions the, of that, that are surrounding this discussion of social justice have, in fact, in one sense, um, tore apart churches, both individual churches and larger denominations. And this morning, as we approach the word, and as I said, it's timely, I, we're, we're here. I didn't plan this. I did not plan to get to this section of Scripture at this time at all. But as we're approaching this section of Scripture, what I want to do is, or rather what I'm, uh, what I, yeah, what I don't want to do is touch the political scene. I am not qualified to discuss the larger, broader political scene that is going on with the social justice movement because it's polarizing. There are people in this context, in this room, that, have, that view social justice on, on one side of the category and on the other side of the category. Just this week, Tim Keller put out a tweet. It was two days ago. And I saw it when it was 21 hours old. It, it had already been commented on 500 times. It, it had already been liked thousands of times. If you had a dislike button on Twitter, luckily you don't, it would, it would have been disliked thousands of times. But here's, here was the tweet. Talking about oppression and justice, etc., does not make one a Marxist. It makes one a student of the Bible. Now, some of you in this room feel that tweet and can understand some categories that are being talked about. Some of you, you're like, I don't even, I, I don't get what he's talking about. But to say the least, it, um, it, it made a lot of traction and it made a lot of noise. I want to acknowledge as we jump into this text and as we jump into this topic of social justice that I am not trying to have the final sermon that is going to lay to rest all of the arguments that have been brought forth over the many years that this topic has been discussed. 
I, I know that I'm going to handle this insufficiently, and I know that there are going to be things that, that you want to say, but what about this? And I just want to acknowledge at the beginning, I can't cover all of those things, but what I do plan on doing this morning is look at what the Bible says about social justice and justice. So the first thing that I want to do, even before we jump into 22.16 through 23.9, is acknowledge the fact that justice is needed. Acknowledge the fact that the presence of sin means that injustice occurs. It occurred at the very time of the fall, and it has occurred up till now, and it will occur until Christ returns. Pain and harm and oppression and anger are present in this world. They are present and they are, are ever powerful. And, and the Lord and, and scripture acknowledges that injustice and, and rather calls us to act upon it. You see, getting away from injustice is impossible because sin is present. And we are called to fight for injustice. It's clearly seen throughout scripture, this fight, this call to fight both in the Old and New Testament. So even before we jump into Exodus, I just want to read for you a list of scriptures. Isaiah 117. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct opposition. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead for the widow's cause. Psalm 82, 3 through 4. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Leviticus 19.15, do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Psalm 33.5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Proverbs 31.8-9, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rights of all who are destitute, speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Isaiah 42.3-4. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will, not, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And finally, Luke 4, 18 through 19. This is Jesus speaking. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, to recover the sight of the blind, and to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It is clear that God and the people of God have been called to fight for those who are the oppressed, for those who are being harmed, for those who are being attacked, for those who are living under injustices. Our restored relationship with God, our regeneration, the fact that our eyes have been opened, that we have, we have been restored to the right relationship with God changes how we approach God. Talk about that all the time. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We can come into this place, and instead of coming in and trembling and fear, we can come in with joy and gladness and say, I can be in the presence of God. But that regeneration also changes how we treat, defend, and fight for our fellow human being, for our neighbor. That relationship changes not only our relationship with God, but our relationship with our neighbor God hates injustice. That's what that list of verses was talking about. And that is just a smothering. I had to stop for the sake of time. God hates injustice. And as his children, as his restored, renewed image bearers, we need to hate injustice as well. Now, right now, some of you are worried about what road I'm about to go down. Some of you are like, oh dear, he's about to become a social justice warrior. And this discussion of injustice, this discussion of injustice is so difficult because who gets to determine what justices, what injustices we are fighting for? Who gets to decide what is right and wrong in this whole discussion of social justice? Who gets to decide 
what is actually an injustice and what is not an injustice. As I was studying for this, I came across this quote, which I think um, appropriately describes the issue with the social justice movement. And on this part, I do mean outside of the church, the political social justice movement. It says this. Social justice owes its immense popularity precisely to the ambiguity and meaninglessness it can, and, and its meaninglessness. It can be used by different people holding quite different views to designate a wide variety of different things. Its obvious appeal stems from its pervasive strength and from its positive connotations, which allows the user to praise his own ideas and simultaneously express contempt of the ideas of those who don't agree with him. The issue with the social justice movement, and even when I say we need to fight for injustices, is because the question then comes to who gets to decide what we're fighting for? One of the ways that social justice has been defined as the elimination of all forms of social oppression. Again, who gets to define what the oppression is? This is honestly why this discussion of social justice has been, has been such a difficult one in the church today and even in the world today. Because no one can truly figure out what we're fighting for. But... As a society, as a society and even as a church, we, we are trying to determine who are the oppressed. We're trying to determine who are the oppressors. We've been trying to determine who is right and who is wrong, who needs to change, who needs to be helped, who is a victim and who is a, an attacker. The struggle is to determine who has the authority on the subject, who has the authority to actually say this is what is right and this is what is wrong. Or to say it another way, to quote Keller again, which justice? Here's what Keller says. There have never been stronger calls for justice than those we are hearing today. But seldom do these issuing the call acknowledge that currently there are competing versions of justice, often at sharp variances, and none of them have achieved anything like a cultural consensus, not even in the single country of the U.S., it is overconfident to assume that anyone will adopt your view of justice rather than some other merely because you say so. You see, justice has often been set based upon feelings and preferences, based upon what I feel is right and wrong and based upon what my personal preferences are. But when we treat people based upon our feelings and preferences, there is absolutely no clear answer. You see, the problem with this movement, and I know I'm speaking broadly about it before I get into Exodus, we are going to get to Scripture because that's ultimately where where we're going to land. But the problem with this discussion of justice is we have placed man at the center. We've placed ourselves at the center. And I I know, and in this, we've, we've placed, I've placed myself at the center. You've placed yourself at the center. When you come to this, we struggle with placing ourselves at the center, but man is never at the center. This is the very problem with the fall. Adam and Eve took God from the center and put themselves in the center, and we've been dealing with that struggle ever since. And so man is at the center, but man is not in charge. God is in charge. Man doesn't have the authority to set the rules for life and godliness, and yet we so much want to give the rules for life and godliness. We have to play in the sandbox that God placed us in. Or as one author says, it's God's world and therefore it's God's rules. This is why our understanding of Eden was so important. This is why when I started this section, I went back to Eden so that we would understand where it all began. Because unless you know what human beings are here for, you will never come to any agreement as to what good and bad behavior is and therefore what justice is. Unless you understand why you have been created and what God has called you to do, you will never understand how you should live on this earth. Because when we are regenerated and restored to a relationship with God, we are also, as we have said, restored to that original command of be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over this earth and be image bearers and worshipers of God spreading his glory throughout this earth. 
So we've seen from Scripture that God desires justice. We've seen that this is not just a topic that we can turn a blind eye to and go, that doesn't matter, that is, um, that's a pointless conversation. We've seen that God has taken the time to talk about that. But what I want to do this morning is look at what justice actually is. You see, we have to play in the sandbox that God created for us. And it's God's word, world, and so it's God's rule. And so God alone gets to set the standard for justice. This leads us to our text this morning. After the nation of Israel was restored in their relationship with God, they are offered the book of the covenant. The book of the covenant is, as, as I have said before, the, um, the boots on the ground realities of God's law. It's the boots on the ground reality of here is how you are going to apply the Ten Commandments, but my laws to your everyday life while you are living in a broken world. It's not going to be as easy as you think you're going to need help. And so he lists for them, this is how this is going to work out in this broken world. As we're going to see this morning in 2216 through 239, we're going to see that God cares deeply about his own glory. Second, we're going to see that he cares deeply about his created order. And third, he cares deeply about his creatures. Now that we have a renewed relationship with him, this is how we live as his children. I, I want to read for you this entire passage um, just to set the scene there's going to be some odd things in here. There's going to be some hard things in here. There's going to be some things that might catch you off guard. But I think I'm just going to allow Scripture to, to speak for itself, and then we will um, move on from there. Just a footnote. Uh, I've actually said 22.16. This, this section actually starts in 22.17. I should have covered 22.16 last week, but um, I, I didn't, and it's just because where the commentators broke up the headings it, uh, it, it, it didn't flow as well. 16 should go with 15. So I'm actually gonna start in uh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 18. So it says this, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. You were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not extract interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, he shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and the overflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me, and you shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother, but on the eighth day you shall give it to me. Then you shall consecrate to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the fields. You shall throw it to the dogs. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with many who do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a law nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to the poor man. In his lawsuit, if you meet your enemy's oxen or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of the one who hates you lying down under its burdens, you shall refrain from leaving it with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in this lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe. For a bribe binds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner, and you know the heart of your sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Exodus, of Egypt. This begins by talking about the fact that God cares deeply 
for his own glory. These first three commands for, if you, if you will, social justice, or can, if we can change it, biblical justice, are talking about God protecting his own glory. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Why? Because she is leading people away from Yahweh. You shall, whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Why? Because lying with an animal is, um, is perverting the created order. Whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. Why? Because it is denying the presence of the Lord and it is causing um, adult, uh, it is, is uh, idolatry to happen. I did say these are gonna be difficult, didn't I? Because if you apply them today, that means that anyone who is idolatrous or anyone who is denying the existence of God uh, should be put to death. I'm gonna slow down real fast because if you start to apply that, that's gonna be difficult. If you start to, to um, uh, apply that today, well, well that, that's gonna be hard. We have to keep in mind what the nation of Israel is in the story of God's plan of redemption. We have to understand what role Israel is playing. Israel is an illustration, is an analogy to us of how God is going to redeem the world. Israel is an example to us of what God is doing in our lives. And in this way, Israel is the example that no matter how much you apply these laws, no matter how much you try to apply the law of God to the world, injustice is still going to happen. Honestly, Israel is the example that moralism and that um, just trying to change your own heart on the outside is not enough because the problems continue, because Israel failed, because Israel was weak, because at the end of Israel, even when they did everything to the best of their abilities, they were no better than being a sinful, desperate nation at the end of it. No, in one sense, Israel proves that social justice or biblical justice is not enough. That no matter how consistent or effective you are with applying these truths, sin is still there. I think that's the issue that we can, we can get caught up in in this discussion of social justice or biblical justice. We can assume that if we can just apply it enough, this world will be better. But guess what? You can, be all, you can be as perfect as you possibly can be, and yet you are still a sinner and sin will still reign. Christ is still needed. What Israel, in fact, demonstrates is that Christ is at the end of all things. Christ still has to come and make all things new. As we're moving on in this section from 21 to 23, 9, we're, we kind of jump. This first section is talking about God is concerned about his own glory and God is concerned about the created order. But in this next larger section, God jumps and he demonstrates that he cares about his creatures, all of his creatures. Not only those who have been redeemed by him and have been reconciled to him, but all of his creatures. You see, the Bible depicts the human world as a profoundly interrelated community. I need you and you need me. I need you and you need me in the church, most definitely, but guess what? I need other humans regardless whether they are a redeemed child of God because we are in this world together. There is this interrelated community. That's ultimately what he's talking about here. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him. It's, it's demonstrating that even the sojourners, even the people who are coming from outside of you, that this, this interconnectivity, well, it, it, we, should, we should consider how we relate to our neighbors and we should even consider how we, how we relate to people who are foreign from us. You see, once again, as I said last week, this demonstrates that there's this equality, that everyone has this equal worth, everyone has this equal need because we all share in the same image of God. When I look at other people around me, I should, regardless of Christian or not, I should worry about how they are being treated. You know, when I look at these verses, it's, it's so easy for me to just apply them to the church. 
like just the, the people of God, fellow Christians. Go back to the word sojourner. If you're a sojourner, you're an outsider. If you're a sojourner, you're a foreigner. If you're a sojourner, you're not from the same country and more than likely, you're not from the same religious orientation, religious background. And yet, God is calling the people of Israel and calling his people, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Even when it comes down to being a false witness and when it comes down to um, lending money to people, again, he's saying it doesn't matter if you're from the same church. It doesn't matter who it is as you relate to the people around you, even those outsiders, you need to do so with justice. This viewpoint can seem extreme. If, 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 as we just read this, if you read over this and you consider this and you start to apply this to your life, this viewpoint can seem extreme, dare I say, radical. It assumes you're going to live life with people who are different than you. It assumes you're going to live life with people who have different viewpoints than you, and it assumes that you are going to treat them like a creature of God. When we are saved, we are called out of darkness. When we are saved, we are regenerated and our eyes are opened. When, when we are saved, our relationship with God is restored. And with our relationship with God being restored, we also have a restored understanding of how his creatures are, um, were, were created to live and to operate. But when we are saved, we are not plucked from darkness. We're not taken out of this world. We're not placed in some special camp that only Christians reside in. When we are saved, we, our, our eyes are opened and, and our, and our uh, hearts are renewed and we become lights, but we live in a dark world. We are not taken from that world, but rather we live in that world and being lights in a dark world, we are now living as testimonies of God's grace in our life. We're now living as testimonies of this is how God created us to live. As people of God, we are not removed from darkness, but rather we are sent out into it. We are sent out into it to proclaim the excellencies of him. We are sent out into it to say, this is how you are supposed to operate. This section, this section of scripture is difficult for us to apply to our lives because this section of scripture is radical, but also this, sec this section of scripture means that we are going to give up things from ourselves to help those around us. Why are you going to lend money to somebody and not exact interest? Why, why are you going to say, yeah, sure, I'll give you something that I've worked hard for, but I want something in return because you're looking at that other person going, you know what? Let me help you out of the goodness of my heart. Let me help you just because you are a fellow human. This whole idea of if, if you take somebody's cloak in a pledge, you shall return it before the sun goes down. You, what ultimately that means and how we could apply that today is don't take from somebody, exact from somebody, so much so that their livelihood is put in jeopardy. And yet in this world, we see that type of oppression, that type of anger, that type of hatred, that type of injustice all over the place. But just allow me to be raw for a moment. Allow me to be maybe even vulnerable for a moment. When I read passages like this one, it's very easy for me to hide behind the organization of the church. It's very easy for me to go, of course the church needs to be worried about injustice and needs to be worried about those who are oppressed. Of course the church is going to do that. Yes, I am going to stand behind the church who does that. And yet, I stand behind the church. If the church gives me something to do, yes, I will do that with them. But if the church doesn't give me anything to do, I'm not going to do that. But notice where each and every one of these statements start. 
you shall not wrong a sojourner. If you lend money, you shall not delay an offering from the fullness. You shall be consecrated to me. You shall not spread false, a false report. If you meet an enemy's ox, you shall not pervert justice. You shall not oppress a sojourner. When we think you, when I think you, I want to go the organization of the church. Yes, them, us, we. I, I want to say it's that, that is what's being talked about. But this passage, what is being talked about, it's me, you, directly, independently, not just this church. It's calling us individually on the carpet when you see somebody oppressed Help them when you are living your life. Serve them. You know, it's so easy to let the organizations of our world, the organizations of the church, do the talking and the actions for us. Sure, if you organize a food drive, if you organize a rally, if you organize something, I'm gonna show up. But if you don't organize that, if that isn't there, then you know what? my responsibility stops. It's so easy for us to stand for something, but it, it's really hard for us to do something. And standing for something and doing something are two very different things. Let me apply this in another area of our Christian life, if I haven't convicted you enough already. The Great Commission. The Great Commission is a similar thing. And honestly, the Great Commission is one of these that I feel just as guilty about failing at as I do the topics like this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the ends of the age. It's very easy to assume that, you know what? The Great Commission applies to the leaders of the church. The Great Commission applies to the organization of the church. The Great Commission applies to other people. As a pastor, I, I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of not realizing that that responsibility to share the glory of God, that he, of how he has changed my heart, that responsibility is on my shoulders because I am his individual child. It's very easy for us to even take this great commission and say, you know what? That's the church's responsibility. That's not my responsibility. In the same way, it's very easy for us to assume that this call for biblical justice is the church's responsibility and not my individual responsibility. God has called a family together through his son God has adopted all of us into his family and each person is an active and personal member of that family. I wanna know what that means? No one in the family of God can say, I'm just a passive participant in this fight for justice. In the same way that no one can say that I'm a passive participant in the proclamation of the gospel to this world. No one can say that's somebody else's job. What we have to say is because God has changed my heart, has opened my eyes, because I am his child, I have been called out to spread his glory into a dark world. 1 Peter 2.9. Again, you, you, Individually, you are a chosen race. You, every one of you who are believing in Christ today are a royal priesthood. You are a member of a holy nation. You are a people of his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What do we get to proclaim what as the people of God do we get to proclaim? That the Lord has opened our eyes to the truth of the gospel and he has also opened our eyes to the truth of how his creatures are supposed to live and he has enabled us and he has sent us out into the world to live in such a way that is radical because it is different. 
because it, it is concerned for the oppressed. It is concerned for the weak. It is concerned for those who are being attacked. It is concerned for those injustices. And it is concerned for how creatures treat each other. Isaiah 43. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not go, grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. I guess at the end of this, where I just wanna leave you, it's where I've, I'm really leaving myself, is the Lord hates injustices. The Lord hates to see people who are oppressed. The Lord is working and acting for those people who are needy. The, and he has called his creatures to spread that good news right alongside the gospel. It doesn't take the place of the gospel. Because this is the other issue. If you only, if you only try to just worry about those injustices and, and try to, to, um, to rescue those who are oppressed, but you don't share, them, share with them the good news, then great, awesome. Maybe their life on this earth is gonna be better, but their life in eternity is gonna be no better. But as his people, we get to proclaim the excellencies of him that Christ God sent his son Christ to take on flesh to be weak, to be broken, to live in those injustices, to, be, to die when he shouldn't have died, to take on sin when he shouldn't have taken on sin so that we might be redeemed and have our eyes open to the truth of the gospel and to the understanding of how God intended his creatures to live. As we turn towards the table this morning. When we come to this table and when we consider the saving work of Christ, we don't consider it as what God did for the organization of the church. We don't consider it for what Christ did for the, the, for the many. We consider it for what Christ did for you. Imagine those who are in Christ, he has individually saved. He has individually called you by name. He has individually renewed your mind, restored your heart, changed your, took out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. He has opened your eyes. He individually called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we come before the table, it is a reminder that when we come here, we don't come here, it, we come here as a group, but we come here as individuals coming before the throne and saying, thank you, Lord, for giving me what I needed, and that is a perfect life and a satisfactory death. That is what we get to celebrate this morning. Let's pray and we can do that together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for your gospel that came into this earth, into this dark earth and blew it up. Thank you that we can come before you as people graciously recognizing that we did not deserve the salvation. We did absolutely nothing to deserve your grace. The only reason we are here today is because you have loved us you allowed your face to shine upon us. You opened our eyes to the truth of the gospel and that's not because of anything we have done, but because of everything you have done. Lord, help that reality to propel our lives to testify of your greatness, both in our proclamation of the gospel with everyone we come in contact with in our, in, and in our desire to fight for those who are oppressed to fight for those who are under, who are feeling the consequences of sin even more so. Help us to fight for those people, not because it will save them, but because it demonstrates the reality of the gospel that we who were once far off, you have brought us near to you. Father, thank you for this church, 
for this body, that we get to struggle with these difficult things together. Father, help this conversation, this sermon, not to create a wedge between anyone and this body, not to create a wedge between each other, but help these conversations to bring us closer together in unity and to bring us closer to you in love. In your name, amen.